Hello. We're continuing our study in Joshua. Today we're going to be doing what's called the Southern Campaign. Now, as you might know, the book of Joshua, when chapters 1 through 12 talk about the conquest of the Promised Land, then 13 through the end of the book talk about the division of the Promised Land. Within the conquest, there are three seemingly directional areas of Joshua's conquest. The central area where Jericho and Ai, then the southern area we're going to deal with today in chapters 9 and 10, and finally a northern campaign in 11. Now it's interesting to me that really in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 are kind of a summary for chapters 9 through 11, kind of a general introduction. And then chapter 9 deals with the deception of the Gibeonites, uh, chapter 10, almost the first 27 verses deal with the battle at Gibeah because of the five kings that uh, come against uh, first their own city-state and then Joshua has to come help them. And then finally, some other battles kind of mentioned offhand in verses 28 through 39. And then a brief summary of the whole section in uh, chapter 10, verses 40 through 43. It'd be very good if you have a study Bible or a set of maps to turn to the map of Joshua's conquest as we talk through uh, this part of the book of Joshua. Now it came about when all the kings who were beyond the Jordan. Now it's interesting, all the kings. It seems we have two uh, types of governmental structures that we find in Canaan. Number one, as it mentions here, all the kings. Now several of these were city-states, much like we find in Greece. But Gibeah, because of verse 17, seems to be a consortium of cities. And that's a different type of structure. It had no king itself, but was kind of a, a coalition of several different cities. So there's two types we know of. Now, the other thing interesting here, it says, beyond the Jordan. Now, this phrase has to be interpreted in light of its context. Sometimes it means on the east bank of the, of the Jordan. And that's in chapter 1, verse 14, chapter 2, verse 10, chapter 9, verse 10, chapter 14, verse 3. But other times, the very same Hebrew phrase means on the west bank of Jordan. Chapter 5, 1, 9, 1, 12, 7, 22, 7. Kind of depends on where you're standing of what that phrase means. Now, there are three divisions, uh, topological divisions of Canaan that are mentioned here in verse 1. Many sets of maps have a topological map. If you have that, it'd be very interesting to see this. Number one is the hill country. Now that's the southern low rolling hills of Judah. It kind of goes up all the way up almost to Mount Tabor up that way. It's kind of a string of low mountains, not really mountains, more like low rolling hills, but they call it the hill country here. Then we have the low land. Now this in, in Hebrew is the Sheplah. It's not exactly the coastal plain, that's the third division, but it's very low rolling hills, much smoother than the hill country of Judah. And then we have the coast, along the coast of the Great Sea. And that, of course, we would think of as uh, coastal plains, down like on the Gulf of Mexico. And notice it mentions several groups here. Now, if you, if you compare this with chapter 3, verse 10, uh, these tribes are listed in several ways. Sometimes just one group is mentioned, and it's either Amorite or Canaanite. Now, those are collective terms for all the tribes. Amorite could mean highlander and Canaanite lowlander because of where they live, but we're not certain of that etymology. Sometimes there are three. Sometimes there are seven. Sometimes there are ten groups of these tribes mentioned. Now, here we have the Hittite. In the Bible, there seem to be three groups of Hittites. There's a Hittite mentioned early in the book of Genesis that seems to be somewhere in the Mesopotamia area, the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. Later on, there's a huge empire of Hittites that we learned from the archaeological finds in central Turkey. And then also there's a group of Hittites in the Promised Land, and that's the group referred to here. Then we have the Amorite and the Canaanite, Highlander, Lowlander, collective terms. And then we have several other groups. Notice here it says the Jebusite. Now this, of course, would be the inhabitants of the city of Jebus, which is later called Jerusalem, earlier called Salem, and I'll talk about that when I get to it in the next chapter because this uh, next chapter, chapter 10, is the first use of the term Jerusalem in the Old Testament. It is interesting to me that in chapter 3, verse 10, the Girgashites are mentioned. They're omitted here. Why? We simply do not know. And they gathered themselves together in one accord to fight with Joshua and with Israel. They're going to try to pool their armies. These city-states are going to get together to try to collectively fight off this new invader. Uh, verse 3, 
and the inhabitants of Gibeon. Now, Gibeon's very interesting. Archaeologically, we found a large cistern there, and in that cistern was a lot of handles with the word Gibeah on it in Hebrew. Now, I realize that there are some other names there like Hebron and Lachish, but there are many more that have the word Gibeah. So we think, therefore, it's about six miles northwest of Jerusalem. It was a city uh, uh, combined with several other cities we see from verse 17 to kind of form a league of cities. Um, it was a very fortified site built on a low rowing hill. Uh, it is situated in the tribal allocation of Benjamin, we learned from chapter 18, verse 25. It later becomes a Levitical city, chapter 21, verse 17. We know that it controlled the, the uh, trade routes to Joppa and the Mediterranean, and later it became a temporary home of the ark, we see from 1 Chronicles 16, 39, for Gibeon. Now, notice that they're going to come to them. It says, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, and, of course, that's recorded earlier in Joshua. It's that central campaign, how he destroyed them. And they acted craftily and set out as envoys. Now, that's my New American Standard translation, and that follows the Masoretic text. But several other ancient translations, including the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation, the Syriac or Aramaic translation, the Peshitta, and also the Vulgate, the 6th century Latin translation of Jerome, have, they prepared uh, provisions prepared themselves provisions. Now that change only involved the change of two Hebrew consonants. Uh, but I like the Masoretic text. I trust it except in places it cannot be understood. So I, I like to set out envoys because it's obvious they set some ambassadors, not the whole city came out. And took worn out sacks. Now these worn out sacks were basically from camel's hair, sacks like, kind of like our gunny sacks, and they were laid over the back of animals. They took ones that were patched. They also took wine skins. They would take a sheep, kill it, cut off its head and legs. Uh, they would scrape the hair off the outside, turn it inside out, sew up three of the legs and use just the neck, put liquid in there and use it as a container. That's where we get the idea of the neck of a bottle, the modern idiom we use. But now you know that the, the skin was kind of elastic. They put wine in it as the wine fermented. It expanded the, the new wine skins could hold it. But if the wineskin was old, you put fermented wine in there, it would expand and break. So they had patched wineskins like they had tried to use them over and over. And worn out and patched sandals. Now we know from archaeological finds and also some of the literature of the uh, people surrounding Israel that they use leather and they use palm leaves and they use even papyrus to make sandals. Well, they had sandals that looked worn out. We, we would say they had them half sold. <laughs> now this it says, and their, uh, they had bread, their provision was dry, and the word is word crumbled here in my New American Standard, but literally it's the word dotted, which we would think mildewed. Now they baked bread every day. If you've ever been to Israel or, the, or, or uh, Europe, man, they make this little hard bread. You could use it for a rock, it's so hard. In a few days it begins to crumble. Now how long th this crumbled bed would show they'd be left their home, we're not sure. Here's what they say. They went to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal. Now, I want to do several things here. First of all, they went to Joshua, went to the head man, the leader. But notice in verse 7, it says, All the men of Israel said to the Hittites. Now, that's got to be the elders, right? The men of Israel. And then down in verse uh, 8 again, they're talking to Joshua. But look down in verse 15. Joshua made peace, but all the leaders of the congregation swore an oath. Now, I think we have all three types of polity structures here in this chapter that we see developed in the New Testament. We call them Episcopal and uh, Presbyterian, one man rule, elder rule, or congregational. We see Joshua, the Episcopal or one man rule, in verses 6, 8, and 15. We see the leaders or Presbyterian form kind of in verses 15 and 21. And we see this emphasis of all the congregation in verses 18 and 19. I believe the Bible has all three of those polity forms in it. Now at Gilgal, that's an extremely interesting kind of word. In Hebrew it means circle. There seem to be four different Gilgals in the Bible. And that's what causes so much confusion because the word circle means a circle of stones, a circle of trees, a circle of whatever. One of them is obviously near Jericho. That's the Gilgal, the first campsite after they crossed the Jordan River. Chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. But another Gilgal seems to be on the border between Judah and Benjamin. See Joshua 15.7, Joshua 18.17. It seems to be also known as Gileoth. And then we have another one in the north somewhere in Israel in 2 Kings 
And then we have even another one close to Mount Ebal and Mount Gezerim, close to the city of Shechem. We learn from Deuteronomy 11.30, and, and a parallel passage would be Genesis 12.6. The reason for that is when you compare verse 6 with uh, chapter 6, verse... Let's see if I can find that real quick for you. Oh, my. I just lost it. Well, when I come to it, I'll show it to you because it seems to mention another campsite here. Yes, it's chapter 10, verse 21, mentions another campsite. Uh, some have said it, it's a, an error. Matter of fact, many have used this Gilgal to show there's two sources of Joshua, kind of this uh, source criticism like they did to the Pentateuch in the JEDP theory of source criticism. I think that's pure baloney, and I think uh, Josh McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Volume 2, is a good book to refute that. And it says they, they came to Joshua, they talked to him, the men of Israel asked some questions in verse 7. Now, why did the men of Israel ask questions? Well, first of all, it calls them Hivites in verse 7. We learn from Genesis 36, verse 2 and 20, that the Hivites are the same as the Horites. And many of us believe that the Horites are the same as the Hurrians. And you say, what does that mean? Well, it means they're non-Semitic. It means they're uh, outside people that have come and settled in the land of Canaan, but they weren't related to uh, that particular group of Noah's children we normally think of the Canaanites associated with. But what, perhaps you are living within our land. How shall we make a covenant with you? Now, why would they ask this question? Because Moses specifically said, don't make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You see that in Exodus 23, 32, 34, 12, and Deuteronomy 7, 2. It was a good question the elders were asking. Now, notice in verse 9, there are three lies that these, this group gives. Number one, your servants has come from a very far country. How far that very far means, I don't know. Because the fame of the Lord your God, and there's something that would impress the Jews. And then finally, for we have heard the report of him and all he did in Egypt. Number one, the fame of what? Well, probably down here in verse 10 of how they defeated the tribes on the eastern side of Jordan. Now, notice when they, when they mention this in verse 10, uh, they don't mention anything about Jericho and Ai because that would be too recent and they would know they're inhabitants of the land. So they don't even mention those at all. I want to pick up in verse 10. This is kind of a summary of things that have happened earlier in Joshua. The city of Ashtaroth, that's a plural of the, of the word Ashtaroth, which is the female fertility god of the Canaanite pantheon. Uh, this city is east of Jordan, and it became um, one of the places, came identified with Manasseh. And uh, you can see that. Uh, that'd be a good place to look up this word in one of your Bible dictionaries, and I think you'll see all about that. Notice in verse 12 something uh, very interesting. They, they check the bread. They're going to kind of see what, if they've been telling the truth. They're going to look at it. But then in verse 14, now look at your Bible, chapter 9, verse 14. Now, my new American standard has, so the men of Israel took some of their provisions. But I want to tell you the word of Israel is not in the Masoretic text. It just has, so the men took some of their provisions. Now, there's two possibilities. Number one, the men of Israel looked at their provisions to see if they were telling the truth. But there seems to be some implication they ate some of their provisions. If it is true they ate some, and I can't imagine why anybody want to eat moldy bread. It's a sign of a, in, involved in making a covenant. To eat with somebody was to make a covenant with them. But I really think there seems to be two different groups possibly mentioned in verse 14. Possibly the Gibeonites of 14a and the Israelis of 14b. But there is a dangling antecedent here, and we're not exactly sure what the men did or why. Uh, here again we have that the men of Israel, verse 15, are going to make an oath in God's name. That's a very serious thing, because even though these Gibeonites lied, Joshua and the men of Israel are afraid to break the oath. And that's pretty smart of them, because we see in verse 19 and 20 how significant this oath was. Matter of fact, in 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 14, God was mad at later Israel because they killed some of the Gibeonites, Saul. And so that shows an oath made in his name he takes real seriously. Even if someone tricked the Israelites, that oath is binding. And I think that uh, 2 Samuel 21 is an interesting pas uh, passage to follow up. Verse 16, so at the end of three days, by the way, how, did they, how were they going to ask the Lord in verse 14? Some say they should have prayed. Some say they should have gone to the high priest and cast the Urim and the Thummim. I'm not exactly sure, but they took it on themselves to make a decision without uniquely asking God. Kind of the same thing Nathan did when David asked him about building the temple. He spoke off the top of his head, and later God had to correct him. Here's the, another problem here. 
In verse 16, it says the end of three days. In the Bible, that can mean uh, full three days, or it can mean part, parts of those days, which were counted as a full day. We're not sure which. But Gibeon is only 19 miles from where they were camped, and you think they would make it faster than three days. We see in verse 17 these other cities that are identified with Gibeon. Notice the whole congregation grumbles in verse 18. Not much has changed from the grumbling of the wilderness wandering period, except they have a pretty good gripe here against the leaders who acted presumptuously. Now, in uh, verse 20, we have this, lest the wrath of God be upon us for this oath we swore. And I think, again, there, there was a sense that when you promise something in God's name that you best do it. Now, what's Joshua going to do to these people? Well, he's going to make them a hewers of wood and drawers of water. What does that mean? Well, if you look in verse 21, it seems they're going to do it for the whole camp. They're going to cut wood and draw water for all the people of Israel. But if you look down at verse 23, it seems to mean they're going to do it just for the tabernacle or the house of God, which it is, I'm not sure. It's interesting to me that in verse 3, this curse about hewers of wood and drawers of water is very similar to the curse that uh, Noah put on Canaan, Ham's son, in Genesis 9.25. But if it's true that these Gibeonites are really Hivites or Horites or Hurians, they're not Canaanites at all. And so I'm not sure there is a fulfillment of the curse on Canaan here, as some try to say. Now, this if it's true that they're going to be drawers of water for the house of the Lord, it is interesting to me uh, that in the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 43, there's a group of people called the Nethim, N-E-T-I-N-I-M. Now, their names are foreign name, and their tasks are very menial tasks. And many Bible scholars believe that this is this group of uh, Gibeonites through the years who are called as Nethanim. And I think there's probably some truth about that, so you might want to see Ezra chapter 2, verse 43. How better can you... Uh, let me how I put that. Here's a group of people who are Canaanites. They're not uh, followers of Yahweh. They've tricked you into making a covenant, but now you've made a covenant with them, so you're going to make them servants. If you don't want their religion to hurt you like it said it's going to, what do you do? Well, you make them servants of God's temple. Therefore, they're going to have to know about Yahweh. They're going to hear about Yahweh all the time, and you kind of isolate them as temple servants, and I think that's what happened. Now, uh, let's see. Notice verse 24, because it was certainly told your servants, and no, verse 20, read that. That has a lot to do with the fact that they knew something of the writings of Moses, I think. Very interesting. First, I'm going to skip down to verse 27. But Joshua made them hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day. Now, that shows this book was written later. To this day means at some later period. You might want to see chapter 10, verse 27, where the same phrase is used. In the place which he would choose. Notice the word he is capitalized. This he would choose is used in Deuteronomy 12.5, 12.11, 12.14, 12.18, 12.21, 12.26, 12.27, 12.28, and 14.23. God's going to choose a special place for his sanctuary. Now, during the period of Joshua, it can be Gilgal, it can be Shiloh, it can be Shechem. Uh, later on, it's going to be uniquely Jerusalem. And we see that from 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 16, verse 44, and verse, verse 48. And also 1 Kings 11, verse 13, 32, and 36. That uniquely becomes the place that God chooses for his name to dwell. Now, in chapter 10, we have a man called Adoni Zedek, which literally means, my king is righteous or my Lord is uh, just, something like that. Very similar in the way it's made up of Melchizedek. Uh, Adonai is the word for Lord, and Zedek is the word for righteousness, and he seems to be the king of Jerusalem. It's the first time the word Jerusalem is mentioned. It is called Salem in Genesis 14, 18. It's called Jebus in Judges 19, 10, and 11, and 1 Chronicles 11, 4. Uh, it seems it was defeated twice, once by Joshua, but not completely defeated until at least the citadel or the fortress until David's time, 2 Samuel 5, 6 and following. It later be, and David made it the capital city. Um, this is the first usage of the term Jerusalem in the Bible. Although we know from the El Armana letters that they call this city U-R-U-S-A-L-E-M, Jerusalem. -E that's very similar to our Jerusalem. That, and the El Armana letters date from about 1400 B.C. The word utterly destroyed is used here. It's the word under the ban. It's the word harim. 
it meant that everything that breathed in the city was to die. Let me see if I can find that reference to it. He mentions that here. Yes, I think if you look at verse 40, it said, he utterly destroyed all who breathed. Now, that meant animals and people, all people, everything that breathed died. It was dedicated to God. It became holy. This is part of that concept of holy war. Notice it says, like one of the royal cities. Apparently, Gibeon was a very great city, but it did not have a king. It may be called a royal city because it was so large and fortified, we're just not sure. Now, it's interesting in verse 3 that from these El Armana letters that I mentioned earlier, that date about 1400 B.C., that all of these cities except Hebron are mentioned by name in those letters. Now, that tends to support the historicity of this account. Hebron is about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. Jarmuth is about 16 uh, miles west of Jerusalem. Uh, the other ones, I'm not sure where they are. Uh, Lachish is another large city very close. I believe it's off to the southwest if you look at your map. Now, these five kings of the Amorites, now, that's a collective term. Here it seems to be a collective term because all of these are not uh, highlanders. Some are on the coastal plain, and so it is probably the use here of this collective term. They came together to fight against Joshua. Uh, what's going to happen is here, now, they're going to go against Gibeon, not Joshua. They're going to say Gibeon has rebelled against us. There's an interesting theory that Gibeon may have been in the circle of influence of the king of Jerusalem, and the fact they made a covenant with Joshua shows they weren't going to support Jerusalem, and that's why this king of Jerusalem went against them. I'm not sure. But these five kings are going to attack their own city, Gibeon. Gibeon's going to get word to Joshua of what happens. He's going to make an all-night forced march to get there. Now, I want to show you an interesting thing here. If you notice in verse 8, the Lord says to Joshua, Do not fear, for I have given them into your hands. That's very interesting to me because many times God has to come to Joshua and encourage him. Chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 2. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 18. And here's another encouragement of that. I'm going to be with you. But look in verse 11. Joshua has to go to battle. Joshua has to plan a military strategy. So it seems that we're, here's a combination of God's sovereignty. I've given them to you. But man's free will and effort, go out there and fight him. And that's a good balance between the Bible. Yes, God is in control. Yes, God is sovereign. But man must respond in faith. And that's what I think we have here. Uh, now, there's been much deal about the hailstones of verse 11. Seeing as a thunderstorm, God used huge hailstones to kill more than even Joshua killed. <laughs> and here we have God using natural means in a supernatural way. Now, in verse 12 and 13 is this deal about the sun standing still and the moon. The valley of Ajalon is on the other side. Some have said it's a pre-dawn attack. Keep it dark longer. Others said no. It refers to the sun coming up in the morning and going down in the evening. Others said no. It's simply poetry. Now, did God really stop the sun? Friends, I believe in a supernatural God. I have no problem in God doing what he, what he wants to do. Uh, if God wants to slow the earth's rotation down or simply stop it, I, I think he created He can do what he wants to. Uh, scientists have worried about this. I've heard it. Some of NASA have looked back, and there's a, a missing day in so many hours. I'm not sure about that, but I don't want to base my faith on what science has seemed to prove from, our, from uh, astrology, astronomy. I want to base it on the fact that I believe in a supernatural God. And if he wants to stop the sun here, or if this is a form of poetry, I'm simply not sure. I affirm a God who's able to do what he wants to with his own world. Um, Let's see here. Stopped in the middle of the sky for about a whole day. It's in the book of Jasher. Now, we've learned of this uh, from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 1, uh, verse 17 and following. This same book is mentioned. Seems to be a collection of war poems. Uh, we don't know anything about the book other than that. Uh, let's see. They returned to the camp at, at uh, Makeda, and some said that's a contradiction to verse 7. Matter of fact, the Septuagint omits all of verse 21 and verse 43. I really think this is probably a temporary base camp, that the big camp was still at Gilgal down by the Jordan River. Notice he puts his feet on the, on the king's neck in verse 24. Has the leaders do that? That's a symbol of their utter defeat. And notice he mentions here that uh, he says the same thing to the people that God said to him. Don't fear, be strong and courageous. Verse 25, we all need to hear that. And then in verse 26, it says he killed them and then he hung them on trees. Now this goes back to Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23 where being in publicly impaled after death is a sign of ultimate shame for the Jews. Now they would be buried by evening because unburied bodies would pollute the whole land according to Leviticus. But it was a way of ultimately shaming these Canaanites and I hope you'll look at that Deuteronomy 21 passage. The rest, I think you can read through this. It's, um, 
is kind of a summary. This is somewhat out of chronological order. There's summaries through here, which is characteristic of Hebrew-type history. In verse 40 through 43, again, is that brief summary that covers all of this battle. And the land of Goshen in verse 41 is not the land of Goshen in Egypt. You might want to see another mention of this in chapter 15, verse uh, 51. Now, again, I think it's uh, interesting as we go through this, this kind of historical summary that you look at it in its context first. It's historical context. It's, geo, it's a geographical context. And then in its literary context. Why did Joshua record this? And then and only then do I think it's applicable to apply some of these truths to our day. Be careful not to turn the Old Testament into some kind of little moral ditty for you to make the Bible say what you want to. But there are some things in here I think are extremely significant. I think that God had to encourage Joshua over and over. I think that's important that Joshua encouraged the people to have faith. I think the fact that God promised to give of the victory, but they had to go out for battle. That's extremely significant. I think this idea of an oath in God's name is binding, even if you're tricked into it, has some implications for our day about speaking the truth in love and then sticking with it, no matter what the consequences of that may be.